Johnny, I swear, it wasn't me. Honest. I, I had no idea he was your brother. I was just following orders, Johnny. Please. I've got a family. I got dreams. I got a scented candle business that I care about, Johnny. I don't. I don't deserve this. Hey, everybody. It's your old pal, Mike. I hope that you're happy, healthy, and safe. And listen, today's video is going to be a little different. Look, behind the scenes, Hollywood camera action. In the future, I plan on doing a video that's exhaustive and very conceptual and explains in detail how to set up offset guitars uh, the way that I believe they should be set up. Uh, and certainly the way that Leo Fender sort of prescribed when he designed them. Uh, however, that's going to take a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of organizing information and getting the bullet points and all of that. And I just I still want to give you something, a primer, if you will, of how to do the job right. So I've got a, uh, what, a circa 1964 Fender Jazzmaster on the bench today that needs a setup really badly. And I thought I'd just walk you through it. Um, I'm going to try and keep this as unedited as possible, but, you know, there are going to be some boring parts, such as, like, taking strings off, things like that, uh, that I will likely uh, just fast forward through for your benefit and for my benefit and to keep the video watchable and sort of short. So, anyway, we're going to do this together. I'm going to get going and uh, follow along because I think, I think you're going to learn something. Uh, and if you don't, that's okay, too. I hope you enjoy the video. There's my uh, hand in the frame the whole time. I don't care. Okay, so on the bench, I've got a 1964-ish, ish Fender Jazzmaster. I, I say ish because I, you know, I haven't personally dated it yet, so I don't want to uh, go so far as to declare what year it is uh, out of turn. But this guitar is exceptionally clean and uh, really just a beautiful example of uh, that style of tort and sunburst from the mid-60s. This is just my favorite Jazzmaster headstock. This is my favorite headstock, period, from the Fender catalog. Uh, I love this so much. This shape is beautiful and so uh, curvy and sultry and um, I get too excited if I keep talking about it, so let's not. We've got the requisite quote-unquote clay dots. They weren't actually clay, they were uh, tile actually, uh, but we call them clay because they have aged to this lovely brownish shade. Um, other features uh, worth noting, uh, it's pretty much all original and really well kept, uh, and you can see it's strung with a set of Gabriel Tenorio strings. If you don't know Gabriel's work, he winds entirely by hand, and he uses such high quality materials that his strings um, really take a long time to go dead. Uh, last time I used a set of his strings, I think I left them on for six months with regular shows and practices, and they just, they just didn't go dull. Um, They're incredible strings, totally worth your time and money, uh, and Gabriel has uh, invented this sort of long twist uh, specifically for offset guitars uh, to prevent any shredding that happens over these screws or, uh, you know, burrs that might have formed in your anchor plate on the trim. Uh, so they are fantastic. Have a look at his website. I'll leave a link in the description down below, as always. However, this Jazzmaster has a problem in that is setup related. You can see, if I get down here, look at that action. Can you believe that? I have to admit that I can't play this. I just cannot play this guitar. The action is just so high. And you can see that the fretboard, the fretboard probably isn't shimmed or only has one of those tiny original shims uh, like this red one that I have here. This is an original shim from the late 60s, and uh, you can see how thin that is. It barely does anything. So it seems to me that this guitar doesn't have the appropriate shimming going on, and uh, I'm going to correct that because look at how low this bridge is. It is completely bottomed out at this point, um, and it's really not doing its job. It's not keeping the strings in place. Uh, the saddles are wobbly. And because of how bottomed out this bridge is, the action really can't go all that much lower. Uh, I could probably lower the saddles a little bit, but we really can't do a whole lot for it until we shim that neck. So, let's dig in. So, the first thing I'm going to do is take the strings off, obviously. 
Um, the person who owns this would like to try a lighter gauge, and instead of buying a set of Gabriel strings to test things, we are going to use some slinkies. Oh my gosh. Uh, let me point something out to you. How you cut the nut is crucial for any guitar, but especially guitars that have a vibrato, because look at this. This was never going to stay in tune. These slots are not cut correctly for the gauge of string used, and as a result, yeah, it's... Wow, that has really stuck in there, so that's gross, uh, and we're going to fix that. Have a look at this. Uh, this guitar's action was so low that there is literally uh, no room left for adjustment on either of the bridge posts. They are about as low as they can go. What we're going to do here is aim for right about there, I think, is where we're going to want the action to sit. So, so I've adjusted both of these posts to kind of look the way I think they should. And uh, yeah, we'll see where we land. So at the beginning of the video, I pretty much evaluated the guitar as much as I like to. I saw how high the action was. I saw how low the bridge was. And all of that tells me that I need to first take the neck off and inspect what's going on in the pocket. If it's shimmed, if it's not, um, I'm also going to need to adjust the neck because there's quite a bit of relief in there and that will help us nail the setup down the line. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. So I've loosened the neck bolts. I am going to twist them out by hand so that I can more easily remove the neck plate and keep that to myself. I'm going to take the neck off, set it aside, set aside the neck plate and its bolts. And when I turn this around, here's what I think is gonna happen. I'm gonna turn this around and we're gonna find out that it's only got one shim and it's gonna be one of those red ones that I showed you earlier. You ready? Boom! What's that? What's that little guy? Yeah! It's one of those tiny little red shims that I told you about. These guys. And these are thin. These are usually supposed to be the second shim used in offsets. Uh, you will see these a lot on P bases or strats or telecasters. You'll see a thin shim used to correct a bad or inadequate neck angle. Um, but it usually is not going to be the only shim that you see in a Jazzmaster. Normally there's a thicker one that's made of either black or gray bobbin material. This little red shim is not enough, and we're going to have to add another one to pitch the neck back a little bit so that we can raise the bridge, get the action squared away, and make sure that the strings stay in place. So instead of starting on the body, I think I'm going to start with the neck. I need to straighten the neck. I may as well polish the frets and fretboard while I'm there oil the fretboard a little bit, um, and also have a look at the neck date because I, I don't yet know exactly what it is. I'm guessing 64. You know, I'm gonna say 65. I'm gonna guess it's got a neck stamp of 65 because it's got the transitional logo and the small headstock. So let's see what we've got. And look at that. That's another win for your boy, Mike. Let's see if you can see that, that says, February 65, B with. Oh, and the four? A lot of people think that the first digit in a Fender neck stamp uh, is the day that it was made, and that is incorrect. Four is actually the model code for the neck, so four was Jazz Master, and then it switched to 19 in or around 1966, something like that. Uh, but four at this point in Fender's history meant Jazz Master. So it is not the day of the month it was made, it is the model. Have a look at that flame. Leo Fender famously didn't really care for flamed maple. He thought it was a little weaker, but you see it sneak in from time to time. And, uh, you know, if flame isn't always my thing, but my God, is it attractive? I mean, look at that. It's the whole way up the neck. Just, just a beautiful example of a nice flamey piece of maple. So sorry, Leo. Okay, I'm going to fast forward just a little bit here uh, to get past this kind of routine maintenance thing. I'm going to polish the frets and oil the fretboard and straighten the neck just a little bit. Uh, and then we're gonna come back and talk about offset setup. Oh, that has plenty of adjustment. 
I want to see just a little bit of pitch back for tens, not too much, but I think, I think a little bit more of a turn on that truss rod. And Neck looks pretty straight to me, which is always good. Here's a little tip for you. If you are going to use steel wool to polish your frets and to remove gunk on the fingerboard, I, I like to use it as a first step in the degunking process. But make sure that when you use steel wool, you go across the length of the fret and not down the neck itself. When you do this, you leave marks in the frets and when you bend a string, you'll be able to feel it. Uh, and that's not good. So if you wanna have smooth bends and keep your frets looking shiny, go across the length of the neck. And to condition the fretboard, I'm gonna use a little bit of my good friend Luis's oil. Uh, Luis goes by the name Modern Guitar Tech on Instagram, and he's a genius, and he's got his own line of polishes and fretboard conditioners. His uh, product's pretty good, I think. All right, and real quick, I'm just going to wipe up the excess because I don't want to overdo it with oil. You can find yourself having some detrimental side effects if you use too much oil. Side effects such as frets popping out or oil pooling at the bottom of a uh, fret slot. And I don't want that. I just want it to get a little drink. Just a little drink in there. Are you thirsty, little guy? Yes, you are. It's okay to talk to guitars uh, while you're working on them. In fact, I encourage it because I believe that a guitar will tell you what it needs. And this guitar, if you listen real close, I'm thirsty. Yeah, that's why I gave it a drink. Gotta care for them, like friends and family members and children's. Now, is this not just the most sultry neck that you ever saw. I really like the lines in this. Really nice, tight grain on this fretboard. Can you see that? I'm just gonna get closer. Some really nice, tight grain on this fretboard. I love to see it. All right, so now that the neck is clean and conditioned, I'm gonna set this aside, bring the body back, and we're gonna start there. My gosh, just look at this flame, though. Well, gosh darn it, I just don't think I've ever seen flame like that before. Gosh, that sure is a pretty piece of maple. While I was in there, I thought I would do a little bit more snooping and uh, replace this awful deteriorated foam that someone has added to, but this foam is terrible. If you get a vintage guitar and you can no longer adjust the pickups, uh, such as in this Jazzmaster, uh, just replace the foam. Don't worry about originality. Functionality is so much more important. And if you want this like, goopy, weird, gross stuff uh, kept in the case or something in a Ziploc, then fair play, I guess. But this this is gross. Don't don't keep this in. Take it from me. Uh, uh, some guy on the Internet. <laughs> anyway, while I was in here, I wanted to do a little snooping and see if I can discover some more dates. And uh, Carol! Carol! Hi, Carol. Hello. There you are. 4765. This is great. I love seeing this stuff. It's and not every pickup gets dated. I've seen some without, but it is really special when you you get a date, but you also get the name of the person who wound them. That's that's just wonderful. Uh, and it's always really cool to see evidence of uh, Fender Factor employees. Uh, there are some famous names in offset circles, such as Esper. That's that's one we love to see. Uh, and Carol is one that I've ran across a few times over the years. And uh, so, hi, Carol. I also corrected an issue with the rhythm circuit switch. It was having trouble latching in place, so I fixed that. And now I'm pretty much ready to start the shimming process. I had some special shims that I was going to use for this project, but I, I think I've run out. I think I've used them all. But I do have this quarter degree full pocket Stumac shim. I'm going to use this. Uh, 
I'm gonna have to shave off a little bit of the edges so it doesn't jut out uh, on the edge of the neck pocket. Uh, I'm also gonna black it out with a magic marker so that it's not visible because, you know, it just for looks, I like to do a clean, clean job. So I'm gonna use this quarter degree Stumac shim. I'm gonna use the original shim uh, there and hopefully that'll give me enough neck angle. And if not, I've got other shims I can use and we will uh, work it out. So I'm gonna adjust the size of this shim for the pocket and uh, get back with you in a moment. Okay, so we've got ourselves a beautiful, well-polished neck, ready to go. And just thread that bolt in by hand. And I always like to finish off the screws by hand rather than with the drill. You can easily over tighten these. Get rid of some dust on this vibrato because I love to give the guitars back cleaner than when they first arrived. All right, so I've got the neck on and I've also got the bridge in the body. So let's have a look with this straight edge. So there's the amount of neck pitch. It's going over the pickups pretty nicely and ooh, it just touches the front lip of the bridge. So that's pretty good, I think. From what I've been told of the player who owns it, uh, this action actually shouldn't be too low. Uh, he's a very vigorous rhythm player. It was brought in by his son, who is also an extremely vigorous rhythm player. And both of the guitars uh, can't accept super low action. Like it won't be ultra low, super bendy action. This is going to be a little higher for very clean cording. So this might work out perfectly. So I'm gonna string it up and we'll see what we've got. to work on this action. Fantastic radius gauges. Right, that action is way high, but now that we have bridge height, remember to always set overall bridge height with the posts, those little adjustment screws in the posts, because the saddles are there to help you set radius. I think I might need another shim. I don't think that's quite enough. Okay, that action's way better, but still probably a little low for the player, so I'm gonna... I actually need to raise the bridge. Okay, so the setup, I still have a few more steps to go, but check out that action. So much more playable than it was before. This is... Um, what I would call acceptable for action, although it's way too high for me personally. I think the owner of the guitar, like I said before, is a very vigorous rhythm player and needs the guitar to stand up to his right hand technique. So a little bit higher action is not a bad thing for them, but this is, this is already so much better than it was. I'm still working on the setup. I may lower it a little bit, but so far... <laughs> Everything. Stay in put. Still got a little rattle out of that low E saddle, but I will, I will figure this out. And tradition around here, when we set up a vibrato, when we set up a jazz master, I want to show you that the bridge rocks with it. All right, and all that's left is to play test. So the job is mostly done. I've got a few other final adjustments to make, and that's okay. Uh, I may even uh, g reach out and get back into contact with the customer uh, because this is actually for the guy's father. 
Um, they both play jazz masters. They both play with pretty high action. And I just want to double check to make sure that uh, this action, which is lower, still high, but lower, uh, is going to work for him and then reevaluate. So the job isn't completely done until the customer is happy. Um, other adjustments I might make, uh, I need to balance the pickups now that I've replaced the foam. I think uh, the neck pickup is going to be just a little bit louder and I would like to normalize them. Um, I did already address an issue with the rhythm circuit. The switch wasn't engaging correctly and in the up position, which normally activates the rhythm circuit, it would just go dead quiet. Uh, and that just turned out to be a dirt issue. The more you use these things, the, the better they work. Otherwise, I did the setup, I took care of the nut, and I have the action working out great. So I'm really happy with how this came out. Uh, I know some of you may have uh, follow-up questions, and feel free to ask them in the comments, and I will either answer them directly or save them for another video where we talk more in depth about these things. I hope that this, again, is, is a good primer to get you started, something that allows you to see the work that goes into setting them up and that you are fully capable of doing it yourself. Um, which is why I share this information so freely is because I want people to be comfortable with taking their instruments apart and, and fixing things. I think the more self-sufficient a guitar player is, I think the better that is for everybody, including them. Uh, the better you know your instrument, the more free you can be as a player. Um, and when an issue crops up, you can address it and it doesn't uh, derail your plans or ruin a show. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I want to help you, the audience, uh, feel more at ease with the ideas that go into setup and repair and all of that stuff because that's how I learned. You know, also the reason I became a tech in the first place because I was I felt mistreated by a tech in my hometown. Uh, someone was taking money and then not actually doing the work. Um, so I don't want to be that and I want you to feel comfortable doing some repairs and some setup stuff yourself. I hope this helps. I hope this gets you started. Feel free to ask questions in the comments and I will try to get to them. Uh, I hope that you're well. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.